Good afternoon, members of the board. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Um, we're going to have three different presenters during this period of time. I'll be kicking it off, giving you a quick overview of the uh, sequence within the presentation. You have four attachments for this agenda item. First attachment is the PowerPoint. The second attachment is called the State Assurances under ESSA. You will recall at a prior meeting that I had mentioned that all states have to submit a set of assurances to the U.S. Department of Education by April the 3rd, irrespective of whether the state's plan is going to be submitted by April the 3rd or by the September 18th date that this board has determined is our date. And so we thought it was important for the board members to have some idea of what those uh, state assurances are. The third attachment is the actual 145-page draft plan. It's our second draft. I mentioned last month that as we come up with new draft versions, I think it's important for us to always have that as an agenda attachment so that for the public record, we can always point to the State Board's website for the State Board meetings where those different versions as they continue to get updated can be found. The fourth uh, item on the agenda uh, is a document that was developed by Donna Brown. Uh, however, it will be uh, presented by Dr. Maria Petrie Martin because Dr. Martin is going to go above and beyond just talking about the alignment of the ESSA plan to the State Board's strategic goals. Um, but she will be going into a little bit more detail about how we as an agency are working together with this plan. And then the final presenter will be Dr. Uh, Tammy Howard, who will be talking about some accountability uh, issues. So as far as my quick update, including regulations, you probably have heard that on the inauguration date of President Trump, he signed an executive order which put a 60-day postponement on any enactment of regulations that had not been put in with an effective date prior to January the 20th. So for states that are going to be submitting their plans, on April the 3rd, the postponement of the regulations would end on March the 21st. So there are some folks that are thinking that with this postponement of those regulations, it could be a potential problem for some of those states that want to submit their plans earlier. The purpose for the postponement is to give the Department of Education and all other agencies that have issued final regulations prior with, with effective dates after January the 20th, is to give those uh, different departments within the federal government an opportunity to relook at those final regulations. So that's something uh, that we need to be aware of. Ten days later, President Trump uh, signed, an, uh, signed an additional executive order, and I'm not going over all of his executive orders, uh, but this one also has to do with regulations. And the one that he signed on January the 30th talks about how for any new regulation that any department issues, for every one regulation that gets issued, two existing regulations have to be deleted. So it's being referred to as one in, two out. All right. So that, from what I've heard on NPR, is going to be a real challenge for some of the departments, especially the EPA, in terms of eliminating two for every brand new regulation that goes in. <laughs> so we thought that we'd want to know that. Um, the U.S. Department of Education Secretary, as you probably have read, uh, Betsy DeVos, did make it through the Senate uh, Health Committee, helping health, education, labor, and pensions. Uh, she made it through that committee with a 12 to 11 vote, which was a, uh, along party lines. Uh, now it has to go to the full Senate for approval, and that date for that Senate uh, meeting has not been established at this point in time. And also the um, only other final thing I'll mention is uh, a, an acting education secretary has been named, um, and his name is Phil... 
Rosenfeld, and he is the Deputy General Counsel. He's a 46-year veteran of the Department of Ed and its predecessor, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, for those of you that remember AGW. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Maria Petrie Martin. <coughs> Greetings to you all uh, once again, and of course it is an honor to have this discussion with you. As Dr. Fabrizio shared with you, with our extension on the submission date to September, it has given the Department of Public Instruction an opportunity to take time to reflect on the second draft plan, to have further discussions regarding critical decision points that need to be made, and also it's providing us with an opportunity for revisions to that plan. So we know that the Department of Education has encouraged all of the states to think about this comprehensively and to think about the implementation of plans so that we can leverage funding to ensure our students have equity and excellence. That is the bottom line for our ESSA plan. So what you will hear is I do a brief overview of what our current draft plan entails. You will hear about plans for the supports for our educators and our students across the state. You will also hear a theme of cross-divisional efforts to provide supports to educators and students across the state. And you will also note at the bottom of each slide where we have made connections to the State Board Strategic Plan. Um, throughout today's presentation. We have referenced that our current draft plan is about 145 pages of just wonderful reading material and we have all really engaged in reading that uh, in a very in-depth way because there are six critical sections in that plan. We know that there are long-term goals that are discussed in the plan. There is a portion of the plan where we have to talk about input and consultation and performance management. We also know that academic assessments and accountability is a huge portion of the plan. And then again, the supports for schools and our excellent educators and students across the state um, are additional critical components to the plan. So let's do a quick overview going from part one all the way to part six of the plan. The first part of the plan, which we know is yet to be determined, is the justification and baseline for long-term goals. Uh, so we know these are what we call non-negotiables. As far as academic achievement is concerned, we know that we are focused on reading and math from the federal level. Uh, we have to have graduation rate clearly defined uh, and how that will be monitored. And then also English language proficiency is another one of those non-negotiables that is going to be critically important to the plan. And again, we know these are decision points that are yet to be determined, but we also know we have had some discussions about this. Uh, Dr. Howard will be coming up after this presentation and talking a little bit about timelines and next steps to get us to some of these decision points. <coughs> a second important part of the plan is the consultation and performance management. Actually, this starts at about page 11 in the plan and goes to about page 22 in the draft plan. The first key components with the public notice, outreach, and input, and consultation really encourages all of the states to have timely and meaningful engagement with stakeholders. So in this portion of the plan, you will see some evidence of the 90 plus education focused groups in the state of North Carolina. Uh, that we have engaged with. It gives you a timeline beginning in December of 2015 when we started engaging with these different groups across the state of North Carolina and it continues to give you dates and locations going through January of 2016 to late spring of 2016. Also we will be inputting information from Let's Talk. We had about a hundred questions that were given to us through our Let's Talk, which is one of the technology tools we use here at the department, to get feedback from people across the state. So that will be included. The last bullet on this slide, which references monitoring and continuous improvement, is really where the plan begins to talk about the relationship between the state education agency 
and the local education agency, and the review and approval of plans, and the monitoring of funding, and also it starts to talk about the differentiation of supports uh, to districts and schools, which I'll talk a little bit more about in part four. The next part of the plan talks about academic assessments, and again, these are decisions yet to be made. And Dr. Howard will talk a little bit about these decisions when she comes up. Uh, this part of the plan is around page 23, and we know there are two critical areas that we have to discuss and make decisions about. One is the advanced mathematics coursework. This is where the state of North Carolina has to determine if we will use an exception for students in eighth grade. And then also taking a look at students who have a language other than English and what are existing assessments or future assessments, uh, grades and content areas uh, that we would use those assessments with those students. And then in part four of the plan, we get into accountability. Um, actually, at the September um, and October and November state board meetings, we spent a little bit of time talking about indicators and subgroups. So we know those decisions have not been made as of yet, but those are critical decisions. Um, pages 25 to 34 of the draft plan begin discussions, but you will see a lot of areas where we have decisions to be made. Also, we need to make decisions on the minimum number of students uh, for the purposes of reporting in subgroups. And then finally, decisions about participation rate um, and how uh, we will rate participation rate as part of our accountability system. So this is a critical area for us moving forward. The next portion of section four talks about supports and improvements for schools. Uh, we have two new terms we'll all become very accustomed to using. One is CSI and the other one is TSI. And these uh, go to that differentiated support for our schools and districts. Um, again, critical decision points around identification and exit criteria for these schools we will continue to discuss. And then also defining what state support will look like for our low performing schools. We know that our NC STAR system, which is the management tool that we use for school improvement plan here at the department, will play a critical role because we have about 100 research-based practices in that management tool. So we know that we will start using that tool even more during this process. Moving to part five, um, this begins around page 34 and actually goes through page 62 of our draft plan. Here is where we have to talk about some of the assurances that were mentioned before. This is where state agencies have to discuss their intentions to use Title II funds for the, the first three bullets, for the licensure system, for ed prep program strategies, and for educator growth and development systems. Um, the overall support for educators really is where we start to discuss many of the supports we currently have in the state. So if you go to pages 34 through 62, you will see a discussion of principal ready or assistant principal ready that we have here in the state. You will see information about the digital learning competencies that were approved by this board in June. You will hear about the home based system, which is also used to support educators. And I could go on and on with other things in this portion of the plan. This is where we have included a lot of current supports um, that we have for our educators. And then the final piece of this section five is the educator equity piece. And this is where the state plan that was submitted to the U.S. Department of Education to ensure equitable access to educators, that information is being included in that portion of the plan. So the next area of the plan is what we consider to be probably the most important part of the plan, and this is where we detail the supporting for all students across the state. Actually, the draft plan, this area begins on page 62 and goes to about page 105. And I will not list all of the different supports that we have listed here, but we start with detailing the importance of early learning and then we begin to talk about the programs for our exceptional children, our English language learners, 
Uh, we also talk about dual language and immersion programs and the importance of those. We also talk about programs for our advanced learners and we undergird all of that with the whole school, whole community, whole child model, which we have mentioned before and will continue to discuss. We also have a substantial description here of the process to get us to the standard course of study and all of the digital resources that we have across the state to support our students. So as you can see, there's a lot of cross-divisional work that has gone into the draft plan to begin to fill those six critical components of the draft ESSA plan. But we also know we have some critical next steps. So we know that we need to look at the congruence between support for excellent educators and the support for all students. So we have to make sure that whatever programs we have for the students, we have supports for the teachers as well, and that the two go together. Also, we know we will be having more discussions about all of those decisions that I just listed that we need to make. Um, and as I said, Dr. Howard will step up and talk a little bit about that. We will continue to seek input from the field, and the critical piece is continuing to build consensus with our stakeholder groups. So I have attempted to take about 145 pages and give you a brief overview of the key components that we currently have um, and again reiterate the importance of as an agency reflecting on what we currently have so we can continue to refine it and make it even better. <coughs> so I will pause at this time to see if you have any questions. Any questions? I have a question. Done. Thank you so much for that thorough thorough but succinct at the same time presentation. I'm um, looking into the draft itself. I keep hearing that there's a possibility that the Common Core State Standards may go away. <laughs> and, and I see so, a few references to the Common Core State Standards. You don't, you think that'll be just a, a moot point in <coughs> the approval of our, our plan? Um, definitely. I think as we continue to do our standards revision, and again, we know we're in the midst of that as well, so that entire section could certainly be fine-tuned. I think part of the plan does give us somewhat of a history, which is how those terms, I think, have gotten to the plan, but the history of, of the work we have done in creating standards. But we will be revising this, um, and because we have a submission of September, we can certainly do that. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Well, Dr. Petrie Martin and Dr. Rizzi, I really appreciate that this presentation shows this clear alignment between our strategic goals and the draft plan, and it also shows the cross department coordination that's going on. So thanks for bringing that clarity. Dr. Howard. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, so, of course, when you look at that draft plan, you'll notice in the accountability section, as we've said before, that you'll see that it indicates that decisions are yet to be determined. So, in working toward that goal, um, I would like to share with you that on February 16th, we are convening the Testing and Growth Advisory Council, and that is comprised of superintendents from across the state and some of our accountability colleagues as well. And they'll be continuing that conversation around the accountability model of which we have had many discussions across the state with various stakeholders of what the indicators should be. And those indicators, of course, will be used to determine the designations for schools across the state, particularly the comprehensive support and improvement and the targeted support and improvement schools. And so that is a very important conversation that we're looking forward to on the 16th. I would like to also share, as you can see on this slide, that we'll have other conversations with that group about some details on the accountability. And the one that I really would like to highlight in the few moments we have together this afternoon is the double testing for the North Carolina um, NC Math 1 students in grade 8. And I know I mentioned that to you last month. And I shared last month that we would get some data. We were working on it. And I must also correct myself because I think that Ms. Taylor asked me the percent of students that take NC Math 1 in the 8th grade. And I think I said 50% and I was very wrong. So it is actually about 25%. And then when we frame that question, students in middle school by the end of 8th grade is 27%. So several of us thought it was 50 and we were just wrong and we want to correct that. 
When we think about this double testing at Math 1 issue, as I've often said, we've had feedback for several years from educators and parents who are very concerned that these students have to take two assessments in their eighth grade year or any year in middle school where they are taking Math 1 and um, are in seventh or eighth grade. They have to take both the Math 1 assessment and the end of grade mathematics assessment. And with ESSA, the state has the opportunity to discontinue that practice with the caveat that those students who would then only use Math 1 for their federal accountability measure in the eighth grade, they would have to take a higher math assessment for their high school federal accountability. So that is why we keep bringing this decision up, because if that were to be decided, then we would need time to implement that higher math assessment um, going forward and so we would probably have to have a transition year to get that done um, so it probably would not even go into effect until 2018-19 but that would be okay because that's the year <coughs> those students would need that assessment so th that is why we keep bringing this decision up when we think about this just very um, briefly this afternoon because we do intend to come back after we discuss this with the testing and growth advisory and share with you their input one more time um, this decision really can be shaped around two areas, if you will. One is around the students. What is best for the students? And this slide, um, if you look at this, you can see that what it, this is showing is that these NC Math 1 students, typically at 89.3, um, level 3 and above, 84%, level 4 and above, on um, that 8th grade EOG, so they are showing that they are mastering those EOG mathematics content standards. There is some concern that if they don't take the Math 1 EOG, that some of those content standards that are covered in grade 8 math would then fall by the wayside and possibly have a negative impact later on in their mathematics um, instruction. So that is one thing to be mindful of. And of course, we don't know, you know what that impact would be as we go forward. All we have is the data that we have now. Now, of course, you can also see here very clearly that the students that are taking uh, Math 1 in 8th grade, they are the ones that have the higher uh, percent passing rates. Um, all Math 1 is you know, a good 30 points below those students that are doing it in 8th grade. And we've always known that. We've always known that the highest performing students in 8th grade are the ones who are taking Math 1. So we've had some conversations with our curriculum partners internally um, around the whole shift and would we be losing something if those students did not have to take that 8th grade math assessment? Would there be some content standards that fall by the wayside? And so that's just something to consider. Now the other question that comes up is, well, what is the impact on school performance grades? What is the impact on the accountability model? And that is always the question that will come up inevitably. So in this slide and the next slide, we did some analysis to look at what would happen if we removed, in this instant, the NC Math 1 stu students' end of grade test scores. And this was on 2015-16 data, and we had 22 schools that would have a decreased school performance grade. Now, keep in mind that that's just one year with that year's data. There's no guarantee of how it's going to go up or down, but I think it is interesting to see that it's not a large number of schools. It's not 150, it's not 200, it's 22. Um, and of course, to change a grade, um, you not, do not necessarily have to be close to the cut point, but that does become a factor. So many schools may have a change in their numerical grade, but this is a change in their letter grade. Okay. And then the next slide is looking at an issue of what happens now is the eighth grade students NC Math 1 score goes with them to high school, not just for federal accountability, but in the first year when those students are in the ninth grade for that high school. So high schools are receiving the benefit of the NC Math 1 score that was earned in middle school. They're taking those scores with them. What we um, are discussing is possibly discontinuing that practice, and what that would do is it would put the accountability measures where the instruction occurs, in the middle school when it occurs, and the high school when it occurs. 
So we did an analysis to see if we pulled out those NC Math 1 scores from the ninth grade, what that would do. And you'll see here we have 20 schools that would decrease the letter grade. One school actually increased. But one thing to remember about this slide is that we do not have the data to factor in that higher math course proficiencies that would be in play once this was actually implemented. So this is really not a true depiction of what we would expect. So I appreciate your patience as I know we come every month talking about this. Um, hopefully next month we will be able to come back with some more information from our colleagues um, who have a voice in this, the superintendents and the accountability directors across the state. And I'm sure they're talking with their colleagues as well um, because we would very much appreciate um, direction so that we can make sure that we're prepared to fulfill this one way or the other. So thank you very much. I have one, uh, and you don't have to answer it now. It can be the next one. But of the 24.8% of eighth graders who took math one, mm -hmm. do we have any way of knowing how many of those took a fourth math in high school and therefore wouldn't be affected? How many, ask it the other way. How many students would be impacted? Okay. We, we, will, that makes sense. we will find out. And just an editorial comment, I care less about school performance grades than I do with right kids. Maybe we adjust the school performance grade better than we do with right kids. So. That concludes our committee.